Uh, welcome to the Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering Sciences webinar series. Uh, this is the third semester uh, of the series and it started in fall 2020. And I'm Partha Mukherjee from Purdue University and I am coordinating this uh, event this semester along with uh, my very good friend and colleague, Ashantarth Das from University of Maryland. So we're going to jointly organizing, coordinating this. Uh, so um, just a little bit uh, to start off with, uh, let me thank all of the organizing committee members uh, from different universities, uh, but also a big round, round of applause and our deep appreciation to Ben Wright and his team for all the logistical support and that he has been doing uh, since the, its inception. And then one person definitely needs a big credit. That's Professor Devesh Ranjan from Georgia Tech. And I would like to say only one thing about him though, that he uh, conceived uh, this initiated this and certainly uh, form a big team and brought different universities together. As also you could see this semester, I am joining hands with Sid to corner this. That simply tells one thing, that we probably if we really both need to match the enthusiasm and leadership that Devis had and that he showed through this webinar series, only two of us can probably try. So that's the little bit about Devis, so thank you for that. And with that, of course, this is our organizing team uh, committee. So thank you all again. And today's theme is reacting flows. And we have uh, two outstanding speakers, uh, Professor Dorian Jarabasi from Texas and Mechanical Engineering and Professor Ellen Mazumdar from Mechanical Engineering Georgia Tech. Our moderator, Professor Jay Gore is in Tijuana. And unfortunately, I just got a note that he is not going to join us today. Instead, we have someone to fill in. And that's none other than Professor Devesh Ranjan. And that means as the coordinator, I need to introduce him. It's very simple. Professor Ranjan is just great. And let me hand it over to Professor Ranjan. Thank you. Okay, I'm not gonna say anything more, but thank you, Partha. Thank you, Sid, for taking it. It's always a pleasure to see my advisor there. So thank you, Ricardo, uh, for being there. And he's a new member from Wisconsin. So we have two speakers and and I'll just say I had a pleasure working with both of them in different capacity. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Professor Dorin Jarabashi. She's a faculty member, assistant professor at uh, Mechanical Depart Engineering Department at Texas A&M. And now it's called J. Mike Wallace 66 Department uh, of Mechanical Engineering at Texas A&M. Dorin did her PhD at UC Irvine. And after her PhD, I was fortunate to work with Dorin as a postdoctoral advisor at Georgia Tech. So we worked together for a couple of years. Uh, she has done a great work in the area of supercritical fluids, looking at things in the areas of uh, particulate sprays from bottom of fabrication of functional nanostructures. Right now, she has interest in uh, areas related to uh, things uh, I'll say, which is at the intersection of uh, heat transfer and thermal fluid sciences, and mostly focusing on, on, on shock driven uh, interactions with fuel so you can have a better scramjet and other engines. I'll go ahead and introduce second speaker at the same time and give them the floor for next 25 minutes. Our second speaker is my dear colleague at Tech, Georgia Tech, Professor Ellen Majumdar. She started here at Georgia Tech in 2019. She came to us through a postdoc at Sandia National Lab. And before that, she did her undergraduate and master's and PhD from MIT. Um, she is well known in the area of uh, diagnostic development. Uh, she is looking at things which can, which can really help us sense extreme environment in terms of energetic materials as well as a uh, hypersonic environment. With that, I'll pass the floor to both of you. Uh, I'll only request people who are joining to keep their mic um, off and also if you want to keep your camera off so it, it saves bandwidth for others. With that, Doreen, the floor is all yours. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the uh, for the nomination and thanks for uh, the nice introduction. Uh, my name is Doran Jarapashi and uh, the topic of my uh, talk today is a liquid breakup at high pressure and high speed toward understanding mixing and combustion at uh, extreme conditions. 
So uh, the design of current and uh, future convergence systems are shifting towards supercritical pressures to enable uh, performance gain, lighter and more reliable systems uh, for space, aviation, and ground transportation, and also power generation. Uh, in modern design, uh, the characteristic pressure in the cluster for a rocket engine is between 40 to 560 bars. And for a gas turbine, that number changes to 20 to 60 bars, and in modern diesel engines, it's between 10 to 30 bars. This figure shows the overall pressure ratio trend uh, versus time for um, uh, Rolls-Royce uh, gas uh, turbine manufacturer, as well as uh, showing the trend for all other manufacturers, such as uh, GE and Pratt and & Whitney and CFM, they're all moving toward um, higher pressure. As a result of this increase in pressure, the uh, overall pressure ratio becomes about 50 to 60, which in this, in this case, uh, the, uh, the fuel that is being injected acts as a, a liquid-like uh, fluid injected into a gas-like fluid. This condition is referred to as transcritical injection, and that will be the focus of my talk today. Uh, the transcritical injection does not uh, end right at the takeoff for gas turbines. It can uh, persist up to 22 uh, to 5 kilometers uh, above the sea level by increasing the pressure between uh, 50 to 60. So as a result, it's uh, very um, essential to understand the transcritical liquid breakup at this condition for understanding the fuel air mixing and using that understanding for controlling the mixing and enhancing the combustion performance, reducing the emission. And that would be for a wide range of high pressure systems as well as uh, power generation systems. Um, the supercritical fluids have very interesting uh, behaviors that um, uh, really uh, fascinated me uh, when I started working in this area. Um, a supercritical fluid is not a pure liquid and not a pure gas. It has a low viscosity such as a gas, but high density like a liquid. In addition, it has a high diffusivity and zero surface tension if it reaches the critical point for a monocomponent system. They are highly sensitive to slight changes of temperature and pressure, especially close to the critical point. When it comes to multi-component systems, such as hydrocarbon and air and combustor, the supercritical behavior would be very complex. If you consider a uh, transition from subcritical to supercritical, let's first start with monocomponent system. For example, the equilibrium cell on top shows the propane at subcritical, near critical, and supercritical conditions. At a subcritical condition, um, a distinct uh, phase uh, change uh, is obvious in between the, the, the two. However, by moving toward near critical condition, that interface becomes obscure and going to higher pressure, um, we totally cannot see any uh, uh, distinction between the phases. Now, if you consider a more complex case of uh, injecting uh, called nitrogen, which is this dark stream at 100 uh, Kelvin, injected into a hot nitrogen environment. So again, nitrogen into a nitrogen monocomponent system at 300 Kelvin. Uh, this is at 10 bar and close to the critical point. This is at uh, 30 bar and supercritical pressure at 40 bar. At some critical conditions, um, the, uh, the jet is breaking up into multiple liquid structures and droplets. This is called the classical atomization behavior. However, at supercritical pressure, there is no evidence of uh, liquid droplets, and the uh, mixing and uh, disintegration of the jet is governed by the um, diffusion type of mixing. And the near critical pressure has some of the features of both uh, the, the cases. As such, uh, near critical or transcritical would be um, an interesting um, uh, area of research, which is not very explored, especially for transcritical multi-component system. Uh, in the case of multi-component system, especially when you're dealing with hydrocarbon fuels that constitute uh, many uh, species, um, the uh, uh, subcritical fuel sprays have been pretty much investigated for a long time. However, because of the uh, shortcomings of the um, diagnost optical diagnostics at such high pressure and temperature, it's very difficult to resolve the small scale structures. And if there is going to be a droplet, that would be difficult to resolve that at such conditions. The condition that I'm talking about and would be um, um, 
the focus of my talk today would be the transcritical condition. So in terms of the phase diagram, we are dealing with a liquid fuel, uh, which has a temperature uh, at uh, below its critical temperature, which is injected into an environment at high pressure and high temperatures and supercritical environment. As this uh, fuel is injected into such environment, it will get heated and its properties uh, transitions from a liquid like to a gas like behavior. So we use liquid like and gas like to distinguish uh, this behavior from uh, the uh, classical liquid and ideal gas behavior because we are talking about um, supercritical conditions. By crossing the pseudo boiling line, which is this dashed line, um, this transition actually happens. Now, let me show you the uh, recent experiments. This is one of the um, experiments uh, was uh, done in uh, 20, uh, 2017 that shows a transcritical and hexadecane jet, which is injected at subcritical temperatures, but into a hot uh, supercritical uh, nitrogen at 900 Kelvin and about 80 bars. And you're seeing the, its uh, evolution with time. So the interesting behavior is that at this multi-component and complex system, uh, by even going through supercritical conditions, it uh, looks like the um, classical atomization still plays a role as some of these droplets were, uh, were detected after the end of injection when the flow becomes decelerated and easier to, de uh, to detect. So uh, this behavior is linked to the persistence of the surface tension forces, which tend to be zero and uh, totally vanished if you are dealing with a monocomponent system. Uh, the uh, the uh, video on the on the right shows our own simulations and shows the computational Schiller and images um, of um, an endodecane spray, uh, which is uh, in, injected at uh, 363 Kelvin. At subcritical temperatures into 900 uh, Kelvin nitrogen at 60 bars and shows the overall behavior of the uh, transcritical um, spray. Uh, the important thing is that uh, uh, the overall behavior of the spray and the jets can be detected either in the uh, simulations or experiments. However, if there is going to be a droplet or a ligament formation, that's uh, almost impossible to resolve its behavior and droplet uh, breakup behavior at this condition. So although we are actively working on better understanding the, uh, the jet and the uh, disintegration behavior, I'm going to dedicate this talk uh, to droplet breakup at such conditions. So uh, what motivated me to uh, look into transcritical droplet shock interaction is that, first of all, uh, we are dealing with um, high pressure systems that tend to work above the critical pressure. At the same time, if, if for example, we consider hypersonic flights or scramjets, um, that they are dealing with liquid fuel, um, the uh, shock can interact with the, um, with the spray. This can also happen to the droplets that result from atomization in high speed diesel engines. They are also ex uh, exploring uh, that high speed convective flows going through them. So uh, now the question is that how different is a transcritical droplet shock interaction from the cl uh, classical bubble or droplet shock interaction? That was the main question that I wanted to uh, search for. And the second one is that, how does that behavior affect the droplet rate of behavior at transcritical conditions? So it is, um, well established that uh, the uh, the classical shock and bubble uh, uh, shock interaction um, um, uh, is categorized as diverging or converging cases, mainly ca uh, categorized based on the speed of sound ratio. In the case that the speed of uh, sound is higher in the droplet or bubble, uh, we expect to um, uh, deal with a diverging case where we would have a diverging refracted wave, whereas for the cases that the speed of sound is lower and it lags behind the incident shock, uh, we'll be dealing with converging cases. Now, let me take you to uh, the properties of a critical point, and I'm going to focus on the, uh, uh, the conditions of the endodecane jet that I showed earlier in that uh, video clip. 
So we're considering the uh, the changes in the behavior of endodecane and nitrogen. Um, and the most important thing is that by increasing the temperature and crossing the pseudo boiling line, uh, we will be uh, transitioning from a liquid like to a gas like behavior, which happens at the pseudo boiling temperature at which uh, the isobaric specific heat reaches a maximum. And that is translated to a very uh, sharp uh, drop in the density of the endodecane. And as a result, uh, by transitioning uh, through the pseudo boiling line, uh, the um, uh, speed of sound on, of nitrogen uh, that was lower than the uh, speed of sound of endodecane will surpass this, uh, the speed of sound of nitrogen. So at some point, they become uh, the same. So by just looking at the speed of sound, we were expecting that uh, for the case uh, of a low temperature, let's say 500 Kelvin, which uh, stands here, uh, where the um, uh, the N or the specific sound uh, rate, uh, speed of sound ratio is uh, less than unity, we should be dealing with a diverging case. And if we move on to higher temperatures, but below the super, uh, pseudo boiling temperature, uh, where the nitrogen speed of sound takes over, uh, we should be dealing with a converging case. So we're going to see how does that affect uh, the shock structure as well as uh, the general uh, unstable structures on the droplets. Okay, so I don't want to um, you know, go through the details of the numerical method because I'm very excited to show the results in the, um, a few uh, minutes that uh, is left from my talk. So I just mentioned that uh, we developed an in-house uh, C++ code from scratch um, in the past uh, uh, couple of years. And uh, this is based on a diffuse interface method, a fully compressible invested multi-phase model uh, with multiple fluid species involved. Uh, that solves uh, conservation of mass, momentum, energy, and fluid species. Uh, to understand the behavior of the real gas, uh, we are coupling our equations with the Peng Robinson equation of state. And just one quick uh, note about the uh, developing solvers for transcritical conditions. It is very well known that. Uh, uh, developing multi-phase flows for uh, solvers for a transcritical condition is subject to spurious pressure oscillation. And that is because of the drastic changes that happen in the properties at the interface between the two fluids at or near the critical point. So there are methods uh, developed uh, by Stanford group, by um, Professor Emes group that is referred to as double flux, which is basically used for alleviating that uh, spurious pressure oscillation. But that method suffers from a, a, a huge loss of energy conservation. So to go around that and at the same time reducing the spurious pressure oscillation of a fully um, compressible method, uh, we developed a new solver which appeared in our um, a uh, new paper that um, by um, uh, making a new solver, by uh, making a, a hybrid and switch between the fully compressible and the double flux method, we were able to uh, not only um, control the spurious pressure oscillation, especially at high pressure near the critical point, uh, we were able to reduce the energy conservation loss compared to the uh, classical double, double flux method. So with uh, all of these considerations, um, and making sure the solver is stable, uh, we first um, looked at a couple of uh, classical cases of R22 bubble shock interaction, which represents a converging case uh, where uh, the shock will be uh, converged at the downstream pole of the bubble, uh, which represents um, um, a converging case because the speed of sound ratio is uh, larger than unity. And one of the features that um, is uh, well known in this case is the formation of this axial jet. And uh, the results are not to show that uh, the comparison between our computational case with experiment um, was uh, pretty good. Uh, we also looked at the diverging case of the helium bubble in which the uh, speed of sound ratio is less than unity. And this is a case uh, where uh, we have a diverging case and um, because the acoustic impedance mismatch is negative in the case of helium, the, reflect, the reflected wave is a refraction, um, whereas in the previous case, it was a shock wave. As a result of the lower uh, density associated with the helium, uh, the bubble substantially deforms into this kidney-shaped structure, which again, we found good agreement. 
Now, uh, let's see what happens in terms of uh, a transcritical droplet shock interaction. Uh, we are considering liquid-like uh, conditions. Uh, we are below the uh, pseudocritical point um, of the uh, endodecane. We are considering a diverging case at 500 Kelvin, a transition case where uh, the speed of sound in nitrogen and the uh, endodecane is the same. And finally, a converging case where uh, the speed of sound ratio is larger larger than one. And you can see, um, how, um, let me play it from the beginning, um, you can see how the uh, the shock is developing in the diverging and converging cases. And the diverging case is a, is a uh, specific and um, uh, different diverging case uh, when, compared to the um, helium bubble. And the main reason is that the acoustic impedance mismatch for the um, uh, endodecane is positive, whereas the uh, for the helium is negative. So the reflected wave uh, would be a shock wave uh, compared to the uh, helium bubble. Now, I'm going to show you what happens at uh, higher temperatures. And by higher temperature, I mean moving toward gas-like behavior. So I'm showing, again, uh, 500 Kelvin case and 650 as well as 800 Kelvin case, which uh, represents a more like gas-like behavior. So by uh, sending the shock through the uh, droplets, um, we see that these two cases that are uh, actually converging cases at higher um, uh, speed of sound ratio, uh, especially the one at higher temperature, uh, tends to be uh, deformed more noticeably, and as well as uh, the uh, formation of the instabilities and ripples tends to be more advanced in case of uh, 800 Kelvin. And the common feature of the converging cases is observed in uh, between the two, but is more um, apparent in the case of the converging case. However, for the divergent case, um, instead of forming this outward jet, we see uh, more like an inward jet that pu is pushing um, the, uh, the droplet. But in all cases, uh, the droplet shape um, uh, keeps its uh, pancake shape structure. So in the next slide, uh, I just want to make um, um, a connection between uh, the transcritical sh uh, droplet shock interaction compared to the uh, water droplet shock helium case and R22 bubble. So um, uh, the uh, diverging case of transcritical droplet is more uh, has more in common with water than, rather than the helium, and that's because of the acoustic impedance mismatch. And the converging case of endodecane is more similar to the R2 and E2 uh, bubble shock interaction. So if you look at the later time, uh, we see that the density ratio between the droplet and the surrounding um, has a very um, important effect on the shape of the droplet at later time that shows the transcritical droplet shock has uh, some features common uh, with the uh, with the water droplet as well as the R22, but it more resembles the R22 bubble. So it makes a very interesting link between uh, these well-known uh, conditions. Now, uh, I'm going to um, talk a little bit more about the details of the formation of these uh, structures uh, for the converging and uh, diverging cases. Uh, when the shock focusing happens at the downstream pole of the uh, of droplets, uh, we expect to see um, a high, a localized high pressure region, which is also shown uh, through the um, the pressure distribution, and the vertical line uh, shows the downstream pole. So this indicates that as a result of this region, we will have this axial jet pushing the droplet outward, and in the case of uh, the um, a diverging case, uh, the opposite happens, and because of the, this uh, low pressure region, uh, we will see an inward jet uh, forming. So this shows that there is a uh, there is a direct link uh, between the instabilities and small scale structure that we can see in the diverging and converging, and this is all governed uh, by the changes, the rapid changes in the density as well as the speed of sound at transcritical condition.
So um, next, I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, effects of pressure that turns out to be more significant for the converging case compared to the diverging case. Uh, by uh, moving toward higher pressure, the speed of sound ratio decreases. So the shock focusing location does not happen exactly at the downstream, but it will be a little bit um, passing through the droplet. So at a later time, we see that although both of these cases, one at 6 MPA and the other one at 10 MPA, um, have common features, uh, the um, formation of the outward jet is slightly different between them, as well as the instabilities that are forming on them. So this means that um, we can have a wide range of converging cases, but in some cases, which we call them um, a strong um, converging case, the axial jet uh, is more evident. Uh, we did some um, uh, quantitative uh, comparison uh, by increasing the temperature and pressure, looking into the circulation and the baroclinic uh, vorticity, and we uh, again see the trend that uh, the after uh, the shock uh, crosses over the droplet, uh, the um, circulation uh, tends to uh, increase with increasing the temperature. That's because we are moving toward uh, gas-like behavior by increasing the temperature, whereas by increasing the pressure and uh, increasing the density, we'll, be a, uh, we'll see a decrease in the circulation um, as a result of the shock interaction with the droplet. And uh, finally, we looked at the effects of the uh, shock strength on uh, a convergent case of uh, 650 Kelvin and the same Akron pressure of 6 MPa just changed the Mach number. And uh, we realized that uh, the uh, spec ratio of the droplet is significantly affected uh, by the increase in the shock, as well as the um, uh, definitely we expected the circulation to increase with the Mach number. So, um, um, the, the the behavior was expected somehow, but that was interesting uh, to actually see how the breakup of the droplet um, forms at uh, such high pressures. So uh, the, uh, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, I am end uh, I end with one um, slide, and that would uh, focus more on uh, the ongoing. Uh, work uh, uh, in my lab, and um, we are using this opportunity of having this uh, shock droplet interaction to create a condition for investigating uh, the droplet breakup and creating a droplet breakup map uh, for transcritical droplets, which does not currently exist, and that would be very helpful uh, for the engine designers to basically understand what is happening at the scales that they cannot resolve experimentally. So we are um, expanding the range of the density ratios and the pressure and, and the temperature, background pressure and temperature to create a very wide range of both density ratios and Weber number. And so far, this is what we got, um, but um, that we realized that um, the breakup regime is uh, basically changing from a forward back into a, back, a backward uh, back by um, increasing the density ratio, and that means by um, increasing uh, the background uh, temperature. So the, uh, this is uh, the um, what we are currently working on, and uh, we are hopeful to um, consider other effects such as a heat transfer as well as a 3D effects um, to basically have a more um, uh, understanding of the droplet breakup at transcritical condition. So with that, I'd like to just uh, quickly uh, go um, over uh, the main findings uh, of this research was that we found a unique case of um, a transcritical droplet shock interaction, which has uh, features common in between the, uh, the droplet um, shock interaction, as well as the uh, classical R22 bubble uh, shock interaction. And um, the other thing is that we are coming up with this um, uh, regime breakup map for the transcritical droplets for the first time. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank my research groups. Uh, the uh, all, Most of the credit goes to my uh, my postdoc who developed the, the code, as well as uh, two of my students, uh, Rohit and Prajesh, uh, who uh, mainly did most of the computations. So uh, with that, I'd like to um, thank you for inviting me, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. We'll hold the question till the second speaker is done, Lauren. And if you want to ask a question, yes. you can put that in the chat. 
and doing can try to answer but we'll go in the q a session at that point so ellen uh -huh. give me a minute um trying to go into presentation mode um i'm also going to turn off my video i think it's slowing down hopefully it'll make the sound delivery a little better um let's see if we can get it to work Can you guys see the slides? We can see the slide. Okay. Right. Well, thank you, um, Devesh, for the invitation to come give you guys a talk. Um, today I'll be discussing a little bit about imaging diagnostics for metallized combustion systems. Um, so I was looking at Doran's talk earlier and I see a lot of really cool, um, you know, measurements that could be made in her environment. So I think that's a, you know, maybe there's some opportunities for collaboration. Um, but very quickly, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about, um, let me see if I can close this so it's not in your way too. Um, so, okay. so I'll talk a little bit about what we do in my lab. Um, we do a variety of different um, uh, technologies. What we're really interested in is new sensing technologies. We have lots of different applications for them, starting from um, robotics uh, to advanced instrumentation, stochastic system identification. We also do some magnetic sensing and some advanced optics and radar applications. But at the end of the day, we're building sensors to measure things. So we're really interested in complex and harsh environments. So we're making measurements um, in combustion systems, turbulent flames, energetic materials, hypersonic flows, uh, multi-phase flows, and a bunch of other um, areas. So today, actually, I'm gonna focus a lot on um, energetic materials and solid rocket propellants, um, since this topic of today is reacting flows. Um, so hopefully you guys will find that interesting or maybe unique. Um, so, I'll start, start by talking a little bit about reacting flows. Um, so, the types of flows that we're interested in are propellants and energetic materials. These materials are often very complex. There's not, there's not uh, just one type of material. There's often things like metals, um, uh, additives, uh, all sorts of binders. And so, they can be very complicated. Um, the reason they add metals to a lot of these um, systems is that it increases specific impulse, um, produces, um, makes the burning faster, increases burn rate. Um, increases flame temperatures, so you'll see them in solid rocket propellants often. So the rockets that you you know launch into space, um, and you'll often often see um, metals in pyrotechnics and metals in explosives. Um, so these environments are also really difficult to make measurements in. Um, they're often plagued by flame distortions, shock waves, um, bright emissions, and so um, making or making diagnostics work in these applications um, is very difficult. So there's a couple of um, techniques that work really well. Um, so what we're really interested in at the end of the day is understanding the combustion properties, uh, temperature properties, uh, fundamental combustion mechanisms, and we're interested in looking at new formulations for these materials, validating models, and looking at ways to prevent accident scenarios. So there's all sorts of different things that we're looking for when we want to study these physics. All right, so um, in particular, we're interested in studying um, particle droplet and fragment sizes. Um, those are one set of diagnostics. Um, we can use them for finding three-dimensional position and velocity. Another set of diagnostics we're interested in are for particle or surface temperatures, and those are really important for understanding where in the combustion process you're in. Um, so I'll start with talking about um, metallized solid rocket propellants. So solid rocket propellants um, often have aluminum in them to increase specific impulse. So I'll play this short video. Hopefully it'll play. Um, and it's basically, it basically looks like a sparkler. If you get a really small sample, it looks like a really bright sparkler. Um, the aluminum particles tend to agglomerate on top of the surfaces, create little balls that will lift off of the surface. Um, if you can see my mouse. Um, and they, you know, create these interesting structures. They have uh, particle trails, they have oxide caps, they have flame zones. And so these are really interesting and we like to study their particle size statistics and their temperature statistics to understand what would happen um, in, for particular propellants in different environments. So interested in things like size, position, velocity, and temperature. And we're also interested in sort of their time resolved combustion dynamics. That, that hasn't been studied very heavily either. So these are all some very good reasons to study solid rocket propellants. So in order to do that, we constructed a bunch of different diagnostic techniques. The first one that I'll spend some time discussing is digital inline holography. So what we do here is we pass a laser through the propellant field, the uh, combustion field, and we pass it directly into a camera and the camera um, collects the information uh, for the hologram. And I'll talk a little bit more about how holography works. 
um, in case you know you're not an expert in that area. Um, the other system that we've included is a two color pyrometry system. Um, this measures the emission off of the particles and we use two colors and mapping in order to determine the, um, the, the ratio and the ratio will give you the temperature for high temperature particles. So you can do this with um, you know, low speed cameras, you get high res resolution, but you only get a single shot. Um, these combustion processes are often very fast. So we can also in this picture um, do these experiments at high speed and that will actually give us a lot more information on dynamics. So a quick primer on digital holography. Um, holography uh, was originally proposed in 1948 um, and it's been modified a lot since then. And so the basic idea is you pass a laser beam over a particle field, the particle field creates diffraction patterns, the diffraction patterns um, end up on top of a, a 2D sensor. And so you can actually get a very good idea of where the particles are in 3D based on those diffraction patterns by numerically refocusing the images. So a typical in focus or sort of out of focus image that you'd get on the sensor as you're taking data uh, will look like this. It's a lot of diffraction patterns of particles. Um, the next thing you would do is pass it through um, an algorithm that does numerical refocusing. So it goes back and refocuses to a particular depth Z. And so what's gonna happen is that you can collect all of these diffraction pattern information, you numerically refocus it, and then you can determine the X, Y, and Z position of every particle. So I'll let the video play and hopefully it plays well online. So it was numerical refocusing. Then what we did was apply um, some algorithms for 3D tracking. Um, and then you can obviously tr track them over multiple frames to determine velocity. Um, so this actual experiment that I'm showing is actually a jet and cross flow experiment. So um, basically we have a liquid jet and a shock wave hits the liquid jet and it breaks up into small droplets and you can track these droplets individually to see their particle size statistics. So in order to do these on high speed videos, we actually have to um, put them on clusters or you know, run them on a really long time on computers. And so there's a lot of custom codes that go in the back uh, in the background that are you know, segmenting images, determining X, Y, Z locations um, and collecting statistics. Um, but once you have all the data processed, you can actually start plotting threes and three things in three dimensions. And so this is an X, Y, Z plot um, that you get that you can get from the data you collect using a traditional 2D imaging sensor, so a high-speed camera. So let's see if this will play now. So here we have um, you know, the non-dimensional time, and then we have the droplet breakup over time. And you can see where droplets break up, um, where they go, and you can actually see the three-dimensional spread of um, the droplets. So we can take this technique and we can apply it to uh, aluminum, aluminum particles. So we're looking at aluminum particle combustion. We can get a raw hologram, looks like this image, when we numerically refocus it and apply our algorithms, we can track individual particles. And once we track individual particles, we can start looking at um, statistics for diameter versus velocity, which is um, a really good indicator for local gas velocities. Um, we can also look at other types of statistics, statistics that are really important, like um, the probability distribution of the particle sizes. So we can see particles that haven't agglomerated. We can see the particles that have agglomerated after they lift off, and we can actually compare different propellants at different temperatures, uh, different formulations, and tell you sort of the volume and the, the statistics for that particular um, propellant. So that's a pretty useful tool. Um, the thing we can do to measure particle temperature is two color imaging pyrometry. So um, in this particular technique, what we do is we characterize the particle emission and we approximate it as gray body. Um, and we try to avoid the emission peaks, which are these you know, strong peaks in the wavelength. Um, and so there's some clean regions here at 700 and 900 nanometers, and we're going to use those um, and ratio those in order to determine the temperature of the emission. Um, we can use Wien's approximation, which is based on Planck's equation. And if you take um, two different images at the same wavelength of the same object, you can um, use just Wien's approximation to give you this formula for the temperature as a function of the wavelengths um, and the intensity that you've been, me been measuring. Then we can calibrate our source, our, our cameras, um, up to you know, 3,200 Kelvin on a black body source, and then we can apply it to our diagnostic. So here we have an image at 700 nanometers and another one at 905. If you align these images and ratio them, you can get a temperature. And so this is the temperature um, for that particular image that I had shown you earlier. So here we can see um, sort of the, there's some flame temperature information and there's also some particle temperature information. Um, and it's important to remember Remember that for particle temperature information and flame temperature information, you're looking at the projected temperature. You're looking through um, absorption and other radiation effects as well. 
So there is going to be um, lots of effects that you have to take into account. But after you kind of look into that and sort of start comparing to other measurements, you can see that your measurements are fairly good. So here um, we have a comparison of the particle temperatures that we've measured um, with pyrometry compared with the gas temperatures we've measured via cars, um, with some of our collaborators at Sandia. Um, so this is actually nitrogen cars, which has, um, which if you're measuring the temperature of nitrogen, you're going to get temperature um, elements from air that's entrained in your flame. So it's going to be bias low. Um, so Sean and uh, John Ryder actually made this measurement again with hydrogen cars. Hydrogen is going to be produced in the flame. It's not going to be something that you get when it gets entrained, and that actually matches up really well with our particle temperature estimates. Um, we can also compare our results against um, simulations. So Ephraim Washburn at China Lake um, did a couple of simulations for us, and we wrote a, wrote a paper together, and we can compare sort of our average particle temperature estimates against his um, average particle temperature estimates from simulations, and those seem to match up um, fairly well. Um, sort of, if you're more interested in the combustion physics, um, one of the things that we see that's really interesting is the change in morphology as a function of average particle temperature. So at sort of the low end, this is low temperatures, um, if you can see my mouse, and at the high end um, on the right side are the high temperatures. So at low temperatures before, below the melting point of aluminum oxide, we get a lot of non-spherical agglomerates, so things that haven't agglomerated or melted. Um, in the intermediate section, we start seeing the particles melt. So it's above the te melting temperature of aluminum oxide, you start getting more spherical um, agglomerates. Um, you start at higher temperatures, you get well-defined flame zones. Um, above the boiling temperature of aluminum, you start seeing small oxide particles forming flame zones. So you get a lot of um, different changes in morphology of the flames as you change um, the temperature. Um, and of course, we can collect this information um, at high speed. So this is a simultaneous holography on one side and um, particle pyrometry on the other side. So we can get temperature, particle size, and velocity together. Um, this was collected at 20 kilohertz. Um, you sort of the oxide clouds developing over time. You can see particle rotation. Um, and you can capture a lot of data. So in about half a second, we can get about 5,000 particles. And that's enough for um, you know, a set of statistics for you know each burn so it's a very efficient way of collecting a lot of statistics um and you know these diagrams are pretty cool they have other types of studies on propellant scaling some of the things that my students have done uh, particle drag rotation and studying new propellant formulations so i will say that uh solid rock propellants are really fun to work with um, but they're in a relative sense actually quite easy um, there are much more complex systems burn a lot faster make it to do diagnostics in so, um, so for the second half of my talk, hopefully I don't run over time, um, I'll be discussing how do phase distortions affect this process. Um, so phase distortions are things like shock waves and thermal gradients. Um, so if you start off with a raw holograms of a wire, this is a vertical wire, um, and you add a laser spark to in front of it, the laser spark is going to create a little bit of a shock wave in the front. Um, and so when you try to numerically refocus them, the, the one without the, the shock in it is going to refocus okay. And the one with the shock in it is not going to refocus very well at all. You're going to get all these distortions and uh, you basically can't see the object anymore. Um, and so the question is, how do we eliminate these distortions, make really good measurements um, and try to keep all our benefits of, from holography and not really change the environment that we're making the measurements in? These are really complex systems, so we don't actually want to put them in vacuum, for example. Um, let's see if I get this. So one of the... Uh, techniques that we came up with is we actually wanted to come up with a method for canceling distortions. And so there's a technique called phase conjugate digital inline holography that I've been working on. Um, so as a quick uh, introduction, so this is a traditional holography image or digital inline hologram image, DIH, of a bunch of uh, particles that have been launched into the air at uh, about Mach 6 Mach to Mach 8. And so they have these nice Mach, um, these uh, shock waves. Um, but there's a particle in the middle here that you can't see because the shock waves have, have obscured it. And so what you can do is apply the phase conjugate technique that I'm about to discuss quickly. Um, and you can go back and forth. And what you'll see is that uh, the particle in the middle will appear when we use phase conjugate holography, but it's obscured under complete, uh, completely obscured using traditional holography. So, um, so how do we make this process work? Um, to use phase conjugate holography, you need degenerate four-wave mixing um, in order to do it in real time. So 
Um, and these techniques have not actually been used before. So it was something new that uh, uh, me and my uh, postdoc advisor had been working on for a bit. And that works out really well and has a lot of really cool applications for it. So I'll try to go over it fairly quickly. Um, so this is a phase conjugate mirror, how phase conjugate mirrors work. Basically, if you pass an input wave over your object in a, in a phase delay, you get a transmitted wave. And when it reflects off of a mirror, you incur a phase. Um, and then if you pass it back over the object, you just double the phase. Um, so uh, doing this with a traditional mirror wouldn't work. If you do this with a phase conjugate mirror, when your transmitted wave passes all over it, the reflection will be a, a conjugate. And so if you pass it back over the object, you're going to get an output wave that has no phase component. And that's how you do um, in-camera phase cancellation. So um, in order to actually implement that that seems fairly simple in order to actually implement it you're going to need a lot of powerful lasers and so here's a, a picosecond or nanosecond um, configuration for that so you actually have your traditional holography beam that passes through your object and then you have two pump beams that have to pump a, a medium in order to create a standing wave and that creates a, a real-time phase conjugate signal and so you're basically measuring the reflection off of this little yellow thing which is basically your phase conjugate mirror um, so it's a lot of laser physics, um, but one of the things that's important is that this requires a lot of power. It's a nonlinear process. And so we can only really do this with traditional lasers that are around 10 to 20 Hertz. So that means when I run a explosive experiment, I'm going to get 1 snapshot. <laughs> so that's not really great for understanding dynamics. So the question is, how do we do this exact same thing? Um, but do it at up to 2 to 5 megahertz. So basically 5 orders of magnitude faster. And so um, we had some really great resources at Georgia Tech, and we also have these at Sandia, um, where we can use a pulse burst laser. So a pulse burst laser creates a bunch of grouped pulses, and the interspacing of these pulses can be very short. And so we can actually apply this at 2 to 5 megahertz. Um, we made some custom modifications to the pulse burst laser. Um, there's a, I can give you a whole list of the modifications we made, a lot of software mods, a lot of um, additional optical train things that we've changed in order to get more efficiency. But at the end of the day, this is the configuration that we have for the nanosecond pulse burst um, configuration. And um, this looks simpler, but all of these instruments are very big. And so, um, you know, it's good to have resources in order to do this experiment. So I'll kind of touch on that a little bit later. Um, but here's an experimental setup um, uh, for the system. We have our giant pulse burst laser, the two power supply controllers. Two Shimatsu cameras are very expensive cameras and, um, you know, the entire setup with a boom box in the center. Um, so I'll show you some results fairly quickly. Um, so here's our original line and we have our original line refocused from our holography camera from our PCDIH camera or our uh, distortion canceling camera. We can do the same thing. If we add a laser spark to the system, um, the traditional DIH camera is unable to do any phase cancellation. Um, but if we apply it to the phase conjugate system, we get um, the unfocused image that looks like this and the numerically or the refocused image that looks like this. And so now you've recovered all the um, areas that have originally been obscured. So it looks like it works really well. Um, and then, you know, maybe one of the questions you'll have is, you know, what are the remaining sources of all these interference patterns? And so after doing a lot of modeling um, and testing, we came to the conclusion that that's actually from the um, the time of flight of light, the, the time it takes for light to go from the laser spark to the um, phase conjugate mirror and back, that's enough time for the shock wave, to, shock wave to move a little bit. And that motion is the remaining um, distortion. So can we uh, apply this in sort of a sort of transient or non-repeatable um, events? Can we use it to study um, explosives or other um, propellants? So the answer is yes. So this is a 500 kilohertz acquisition of a shockwave um, generated by the spark. At 500 kilohertz, you only get maybe one or two frames. Um, when we go to five megahertz, we actually start, can start seeing um, the shock generation, the plasma generation, and the shock expansion. So what you'll also see on top of that is um, the image quality is not as good. Um, that's because because these are all nonlinear prosperous laser puts out less energy per pulse as the repetition rate goes up. The second harmonic uh, conversion efficiency becomes lower and at the same time, the phase conjugate mirror reflectivity becomes lower. So you're gonna get less and less um, signal as you go up in speed and it doesn't scale well, it's, uh, it's fairly nonlinear. So how do we 
um, just as a side thing, um, how do we come overcome that? And I will talk a little bit about that in a couple slides. Um, so a quick example here, we have uh, explosive um, bridge wire detonator. It generates particles. It's actually pointed down in this experiment. Um, and so you can see the particles go by. And if I can pause it here, uh, pause it right here, you can see that there's a difference in, difference in image quality for PCDIH versus traditional DIH. Um, we can do the same thing once we have a good PCDIH image, we can um, start tracking the objects and determining their speed. And so we've determined for these that, that they're traveling at Mach 6 to Mach 8. So these are pretty fast fragments traveling off of the explosive detonator. All right. So um, I had mentioned earlier, there's a lot of drawbacks with PCDIH. Um, you know, high power lasers, nonlinear four wave mixing, laser light time of flight. Um, can, can we correct phase distortions in a different way and uh, be much more efficient about it? So the technique that we came up with, um, uh, that, this is actually something my grad student Andrew came up with, is recalculated intensity phase propagation holography. He call, likes to call it RIF. Um, basically, the idea is to do the exact same process of phase distortion cancellation, but all of it is done numerically. And so you know, to kind of show you the answer uh, before I show you how it's done. So on one side, it is holography, so you can see the distortion, and on the other is RIF. And in RIF, you can actually uh, see that the distortion is gone. And so the way that this process, um, like we came up with it and with the way that we works um, for us is it's a single shot process um, and there's a single pass technique and it removes phase distortions, but it does require you to collect information on um, not only the intensity, but also the phase holography information. So that makes it a little bit unique. Um, we, it was inspired originally by some microscopy, microscopy techniques. But those techniques typically measure only measure phase. They don't do any phase cancellation. And so this is sort of the first time that people have used techniques like this full phase cancellation and applied it to this area. So um, you know, Andrew did some pretty good work here. So how does this process work? You can see the diagram for it's much simpler. There's only two beams. So there's the original beam that goes through the object and then a reference beam. And it's being collected by a polarization camera. Um, the polarization camera um, has different polarizations on each pixel. You can sort of sort them by polarization. Um, you can do some interpolation, and then you can combine it with this equation here, um, and it creates an electric field. So um, depending on how much you know about optics, um, in optics, you cannot collect any phase information. You only can collect intensity information because the sensors are not fast enough. So to, in order to construct the electric field, you must have more than one camera in order to do so. And this is a four cam or a four image or a four camera technique. Um, because you're using a single camera for this, um, it, it's, it's much simpler, but you lose a bit of resolution. Um, so the way that we cancel phase is much more obvious once we have an electric field. Um, what, we, what we do is we numerically refocus to the center of the distortion, and then we numerically cancel phase by calculating the intensity. So all we're doing is dropping the phase in the plane at which it occurs. And so that worked out pretty well for us. It has a lot of benefits. It's certainly less complicated than the technique I showed you earlier. It uses much less laser power. These are all linear phenomena. Um, there are no image alignments or calibrations required, and there are no time of flight distortions because it's a single pass technique. So um, to show you some of the results, this first column is traditional digital inline holography. So you can see the distortion and the tracking on the bottom row. The second row is electric field propagation. Um, it's much more similar to what they um, do in microscopy. Um, so there's still going to be phase distortion because there was no cancellation steps. And then RIF H at the very end, or uh, RIF at the very end, we can see that there are no distortions. Um, the only difference with RIF is that you actually get a little bit more noise because you're trying to interpolate for the for all the pixels. But otherwise, um, it gets rid of all these distortions for you. All right, so um, I'm going to go into the last couple slides. This is the application on the explosive bridge wire. So this is an explosive bridge wire with shock waves. So the shock waves come first and then there's a bunch of particles behind it and so by the time the particles combine uh, come by you get a digital inline hologram that's distorted um, but when you apply RIF you get these particles that you can see um, and once you can see them you can start tracking them um, identifying them um, over time and then you can get these really nice um, number distributions and statistics um, so the last application I'm going to talk about is actually something that we've been working on recently. We had originally did not intend to create any of our techniques for this application. It turns out, though, that 
shockwaves are not the only um, types of things that will create uh, issues with holograms. Thermal gradients do a really good job of making holography hard as well. Um, so in this particular study, we're interested in looking at titanium potassium perchlorate pyrotechnics, um, TKP. Um, these are used to ignite thermal batteries. Thermal batteries are really interesting because they can be stored for a really long amount of time. And you're basically shooting a pyrotechnic at a heat pellet. And once the heat pellet turns on, it turns on the battery. And the battery is a liquid metal battery. So um, this is sort of like the first step in the process. Um, so here we can see the video of the pyrotechnic being shot at a thermal pellet. So you have all these particles that are really hot, they're really fast. TKP combustion is probably 10 to 100 times faster than aluminum propellant combustion, at least in terms of burn rate. Um, but when you're doing the hologram, let's see if I can get it to play, you get a lot more distortions. They're thermal gradient distortions. You can see the thermal gradient waves. Um, and you get a lot more, um, it's a lot more complex of a measurement than the aluminum measurement. Um, but we could apply um, the RIF uh, holography in this case um, fairly well. It's a sort of a bench top experiment. So the top row is digital inline holography. The bottom row is RIF. So these are taken at about the same time and, uh, uh, in the same experiment. So for the initial time, there's a lot of thermal gradients and you can't see any particles with DIH. But with RIF, you can actually start seeing particles. And in general, uh, later times, you know, they're much more similar in quality, but uh, RIF does actually produce slightly nicer quality images. Um, and sort of looking into what we're doing now and what we're going to be doing in the future, um, we've been applying sort of um, unique diagnostics to solving this problem. Um, titanium combustion does have a lot of unique um, issues. Um, how can we make these, you know, uh, polarization camera measurements um, at high speed? How do we avoid sort of the emission wavelengths? TKP has uh, um, emissions everywhere, and so we need to find gaps in the spectrum where we can actually do temperature measurements, so that's challenging. Um, and then how do we identify these particles in dense environments? This is a very dense image. It's not super clean, so we have to write a lot of new algorithms to um, look at. And Andrew's been doing a great job um, doing those measurements. So sort of in conclusion, hopefully I didn't go too fast or too slow, um, I talked a little bit about digital inline holography techniques. And I talked to about two phase distortion cancellation techniques um, and sort of the benefits of one versus the other. Uh, one is an in camera technique. So the image you get is the one you get. And the other is a numerical technique that you have to apply extra steps for. Um, there's a lot of cool applications for these areas in the future that we're looking into. Um, we've done jet and cross flow experiments before, and we're going to do some more supersonic jet and cross flow experiments using this techniques, um, these techniques in the future. Um, imaging power which is also great. Um, it has a lot of applications. You just have to be careful to understand when it can be applied. Um, and so the last video on the bottom here is actually um, the application of imaging pyrometry to a rocket motor nozzle. So this is a solid rocket motor. So these are actually, this is a rhenium nozzle. It's kind of small. It's probably like four inches tall. Um, but you can actually, when you turn the propellant on, you can actually see the entire nozzle heat up. And so you can measure the temperature over time. And when you run out of propellant, the uh, rocket motor turns off. So there's all sorts of cool measurements you can make. We have um, other measurements of this exact um, rocket motor with um, veins in it. We can look at erosion as well. So it's a lot of cool things you can do. So um, so with that, I'll, I'll like to thank all the people who worked with me at Sandia, that they were really awesome people. Um, also all of my collaborators at Georgia Tech. Um, and I'd like to thank also all the sponsors for my research. And lastly, of course, I'd like to thank Andrew. Most of this work is actually his. And of course, I'd like to thank Gwen for helping Andrew with a lot of these experiments. They do take more than one person. They're very complicated. So, um, and lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for your time and I'll be happy to take any questions um, that you may have. Thank you, Ellen. So if you have questions, since we have good number right now, we can just unmute and ask a question. Are you okay with that, Partha? Yes, that would be wonderful. So I, I can ask one. Yeah, so let me ask, I'll start with Ellen. So Ellen, when you're doing this uh, propagation, right, and you're removing these on the wave, the RIPPH technique, and let's say you mm -hmm. don't see the, uh, you, you are able to manage your refraction uh, in these images. How do you know the size of the particles you're getting is correct at that point? The measurement you're getting um, for the size of the particles. 
So uh, we can do a lot of different things. We, we can um, put in objects we know, um, and we can just check to see that it's the, uh, the exact size that we would expect. Um, we do a lot of calibration. Um, holography has no divergence when you put the beam through. You always have to check beam divergence. So the size doesn't change as a function of when you refocus through it. Um, so, so for us, you know, we can do the submittal wire in the field of view and then checking that that's correct. Um, and then we can say that there are no distortions. Um, and obviously we create distortions around it with you know, liquid, uh, liquid jets or air jets or th other things like that, or shock waves, and show that that still matches. Yeah, so, so that's based upon the pre-calibration data you have. Yeah, it's a like validation data that you can do. So now I have a couple of questions for you. So one, I think it's just a great calculation which I saw. So you're running this on which computer? Is it these are run on what supercomputer or you're running it on a cluster? Uh, it, they are running on the A and M HPRC. Okay. So if you look at just the Mark 1.5 versus the Mark 2, which you have shown, and the one of the big thing we always look at, and you talked about impedance mismatch. I did not see the raw data anywhere. I, I saw you're talking about in the convergent divergent, but even if you have a low density, sometimes it's not just the density, right? It's the row times C which changes. Yes, so what happens in an environment where your row C is very large, right? In the case of uh, liquid, the row C will be very large, right? Yes, uh, so I think in uh, one of the slides I have reported the acoustic impedance mismatch for all the cases. Uh, maybe I have to, if I can share my screen again. So I remember, so this is, as you know, so this was my PhD work, so I know this one. So the student, the challenge which he had when he was trying to simulate this always was the reverberation you have between the focused, and whether you have the shock focusing and the interface. So okay. how do you resolve that? So what uh, shock capturing stream you're using right now? Yeah, uh, so uh, first of all, we are using an HLLC uh, Riemann solver. And uh, for an, another approach that we took, uh, because this is a diffuse interface method, and definitely the, the interface is not that sharp. Uh, you can couple um, diffuse interface method with, 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 uh, with TINK, and TINK is a sharpening method that uh, helps you to uh, better capture uh, these deformations when the shock capturing happens. But if, if we do not uh, activate that one, then it's it, it become more difficult to uh, actually get the shock focusing point. That's right. Yes, yeah, so if you don't do shock focusing, then your vorticity will be different, right? So the deposited vorticity will be different in a diffuse and a sharp interface? Uh, we didn't um, see a big difference in uh, the order of magnitude of vorticity. We mainly uh, were interested in the small scale structures, uh, which uh, without uh, activating tank, uh, they were a little bit uh, fuzzy, uh, but with the sharp, we were able to resolve these small scale structures. Very nice work, Doreen. Thank you. Other question? Uh, Doreen, this is a simple one. Uh, could you define acoustic impedance for me? Because I deal a lot with impedance, electrochemical impedance, double impedance. I know it's a definition for you, but could you remind yeah. me? Yeah, this is, this, is, this is right here. Uh, this is uh, the density times the speed of sound of the droplets minus uh, the same uh, of the surrounded. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, it's, it's a great uh, discussion. At least uh, presentations, I can, as Elaine mentioned, there's uh, could be a lot of collaboration that you could do between the two of you. So that's certainly yeah, that's uh, one of the goals here. So. I have a couple of questions. Hi, uh, I'm Malvika. I'm a student under Devish. Um, uh, for Doran, um, so you mentioned that you developed in-house uh, 
C++ code solve for multi uh, physics and for species. Um, what are the sort of disadvantages of using a commercial code? Um, you know, what did you see lacking in such, you know, commercial codes? Um, uh, actually, the, when you're dealing with um, supercritical fluids, the main uh, thing is implementing a, a real gas equation of state, which are a number of equation of state, or uh, and the famous one, or Peng Robinson, that uh, is a cubic equation of state. And none of the commercial solvers uh, currently um, have that uh, code activated. In addition, um, you cannot run uh, like highly uh, resolved uh, DNS type of simulation with uh, commercial codes. Um, when I first uh, joined an ANM, I started using uh, open form for, uh, for a monocomponent system, like a, a transcritical nitrogen uh, jet into uh, the background nitrogen, and I was able to get a good match. So it worked for uh, the LES and a large scale, but we were not able to make that work for a multi-component system because of all the the properties and um, properties and the mixture rules that you need to implement. That it doesn't go well with the um, uh, with open source code. So uh, that was the main reason that we started our own solver, uh, which is uh, helpful for multi-component systems. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. One, sorry, one more question for uh, Dr. Majundar. Um, so, uh, in your parameter measurements, uh, what was the integration time that you needed to actually capture the temperature of the particles? That really depends on which experiment um, and depends a lot on your camera. So, how, how, how efficient is your camera? So for, um, so if you're using an SAZ, for example, a high speed camera, uh, we mm -hmm. were doing like 15 microseconds um, for aluminum combustion and then titanium combustion, um, we're using an SA5 and even like you know, 30 to 80 microseconds. Um, so it really depends on the experiment, the, your optical efficiency, um, you know, if you, how many photons are you not using, um, but on the order of a couple microseconds. Thank you. And do you see in future you'll be able to make like 3D, like into the depth measurements rather than um, just on the surface of what you're looking at um, in your hologram? Um, do you think you'll be able to like change the depth of view? Um, are you asking like inside the particle or just sort of a three dimensional no, like, view? Yeah, the three, like a, well, not really a three dimensional, but if I had a three dimensional uh, particle curtain or something like that, so instead of seeing just this, just the particles right in front of you, would you be able to see particles uh, at a, away from the from the corners, like in in inside the bed, sort of a thing? So you do have to um, look at have techniques that actually can see the object. Um, you can certainly apply. I've, I've seen people apply things that look like geometry, um, like volume metrics, uh, multiple cameras. You know, you're trying to track particles and uh, align them across multiple cameras. So you can do sort of a volume metric measurement. Um, um, but obviously, you still need to have some access from some point to see into your particle curtain, for example. So you have to have some optical access, but we, we can make if you add multiple camera to do some additional math. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments or any discussion that I'd like to have with uh, the great uh, presentations and speakers? Uh, hi, this is Mohammed. Uh, hey, Dori. Uh, great talk. Hi, Mohammed. How are you? How are you? Uh, I hope to see you soon. So I have a quick question. Um, when you compare the TSDI with water, or let's say R22 with water, uh, did you compare the baroclinic vorticity production term uh, at late time and then compare it uh, with the, uh, I mean, with, for, with these two cases? Did you compare how the evolution of baroclinic vorticity production term goes? Because when we compare with, uh, between multi-mode and single-mode in the experiment, 
Uh, and then later I did the 3D simulation, uh, which uh, Devish and I uh, are going to submit for the PR for that one. And uh, the interesting thing is that in the uh, early time, because multi-mode has a short time for the evolution and it's already uh, perturbed, uh, it takes uh, at early time, the baroclinic vorticity production is increasing sharply. But then later, the single mode case is catching up with the multi-mode case because the large scale feature is start to break down and then the baroclinic vorticity production increases sharply. Did you compare between, let's say, water TSDI or because your R2020 and TSDI is much more perturbed compared to your water and helium? When you compare these two cases, did you give enough time in your computation to see what will happen when the bubble completely deforms? I think that's an interesting thing to see how the baroclinic production of vorticity evolves at latest time. Okay, um, um, for the water case, uh, no, we uh, we didn't uh, continue uh, doing uh, uh, and and doing the calculations. But for R twenty two and the um, and uh, I think that the, the converging cases, we did uh, compare the the baroclinic vorticity at later time when. Um, basically, we have all these uh, deformation. So, are you talking about by later stage, uh, you mean when these abilities are forming? So, I mean, even later than these, when the breakdown occurs and oh, when okay. the bubble completely deforms. I, I know, know it's no, very not computationally that. expensive. But, no, um, we, we never went through that route. No, we basically stopped uh, the simulation when we uh, saw these uh, deformation. We didn't go through that route. Okay, I, I'm just saying that's an interesting thing to think about because okay. it seems to me that when we give enough time to the flow to go and uh, at late time, very late time, when the mm -hmm. breakdown of uh, large scales occurs and when it's transition to turbulence, then some interesting stuff happens because the uh, interface that is not sh uh, sharp, let's yes. say um, the multi-mode case, at later time uh, has much smaller baroclinic vorticity and even vorticity itself and circulation compared to, um, let's say, sharp interface or single mode interface. So okay. that's something interesting to think about. Um, just That's it. yeah, yeah. Uh, we never went uh, that far in the breakup. Uh, there are many restrictions on going to actually capture the total uh, uh, catastrophic uh, breakup of the droplet. Uh, but mm -hmm. I can um, uh, uh, I, I can say that uh, if uh, you uh, maybe that uh, the diffusion um, is so high in that region that uh, basically there is no interface that you can uh, calculate the the vorticity there. So, where at uh, at what region you're looking at vorticity? Are you looking at a specific uh, location, or um, it is uh, being uh, calculated all over the domain? So, I think it should be localized. Uh, are you talking about localized vorticity deposition? Yes, I'm talking along the interface. Whatever okay. I'm talking is just along the interface. That's so, interesting. especially when you calculate circulation or baroclinic vorticity deposition, whatever you are calculating is small scale features. So, um, yeah, generally when you calculate that, I'm talking about along the interface. Okay. So, uh, but nice work. I didn't see. Thank you. Before. Yeah, we can talk later. Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank Hope you. To see you soon. Hope to see it. Any other questions or comments for our the speakers? Uh, uh, we still have, of course, still five, but uh, you know, I'll I'll let Sid handle that. I need to kind of uh, log off in just a couple of minutes, but I'd like to thank both speakers uh, from my side and of course all the organizing committee on behalf of Sid and Debesh. But I think please continue the interactions and discussions. Yeah. Also to the speakers, uh, please do reach out to us in any way that we could help, uh, you know, uh, connect with uh, other members through this uh, uh, university community. That would be great too. Um, so I'm guessing the variation seed, uh, should we conclude here or? Yeah.
Yeah, I don't see any other question. So yes, um, we should conclude here then. I right, thank you both very much. Thank, uh, thank, thank you everyone. so much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a great weekend. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Bye.